Good evening. Good evening. Howdy. Howdy. And let me let me have you turn in your Bibles tonight to Genesis 24. We're going to continue to read about um, how Abraham found his son a wife, and how Isaac actually found a wife. Genesis chapter 24. And we're going to read verses 28 through the end of the chapter. 28 through, or tw actually 28, yes, through the end of the chapter. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out to the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arm, he heard the words of Rebekah's sister. This, thus the man spoke to me. He went, on, he, went to the, excuse me, he went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels in the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house, a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and feed the men who were with him. Then the food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have, I have to say. He said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has great, greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he was given all that he, to me, and to him he was given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife uh, for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but you should go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and will prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. Then you'll be free from my oath when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O oh Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of the water. Let a virgin who comes out to draw water to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who will say to me, drink, and I'll draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed to be for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with a water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and you gave me the camel, and she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I, so I put the ring on her nose and bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me, uh, who had led me by the right way to take a daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Verse forty-nine. Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. If not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go. And let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abram's servant heard these words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of, and of, and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. 
He also gave to her uh, brother and to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he, he, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank. And he spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us for a while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, Let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent, her, they sent away Rebekah and her sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young woman arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Laharoi and was dwelling in the Negeb. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there was camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, Is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah. And she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do bow before your throne room of grace. And Father, this is an amazing story of your providence. I, I pray, Father, that we would learn to trust more and more of your providence in our lives. That we would see things through the lens of your providence. That we would see that you have ordained everything that comes to pass. And that we would see that it is good for us. The trials, the benefits, the blessings are all part of your plan in our lives. And I pray that you would teach us, Father, to, to have the right attitude and countenance. Father, teach us to trust you in all our ways and lean not on our own understanding. For, Father, your ways are right and good. And, Father, I pray that you would break our hearts tonight. Break us of the prideful spirit that is within us that wants our way, that wants to do things our way and not your way. Father, help us today be filled with your spirit and power and might. May this place be a place where the spirit has reign and rule. And Father, if there's any way that is not right with you, I pray that you would convict us of that sin and that we would run to the cross that Jesus died upon for forgiveness. And we would also run to that cross for the strength and the filling of your spirit. For you have sent your spirit to fill us and to empower us to do your will. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to learn a lot about Isaac in the next few weeks, in the next month. Um, Abraham is falling off the seed, we'll, we'll, scene. We'll hear about his death in a few, few uh, chapters. But uh, really right now it's going to be about Isaac. It's going to be about Isaac and how God is going to prosper and how God is going to work in his life. Abraham is dealing with one last question. One last question. What is going to happen to the chosen line at the end of his days? We said last week this, this, this chapter can be broken down into five parts. Number one was his charge to Abraham. That was verses 1 through 9. We also saw that in verses 10 through 27, there was a de description of the journey that this man had gone on to find Rebekah. The third part of this great passage was found in verses 28 through 53, where we see the young servant giving an explanation to Rebecca's family of the charge that he had been given and of the journey that he had taken. The fourth part of the chapter you see in verses 54 through 58, where the servant immediately requests Rebecca to be taken home to his, to his master. And finally, in verses 59 through, 50, through 67, we see Rebecca's departure from her home and her marriage to Isaac. You see, we're going to look at the last three sections tonight. We, we talked about the other ones last week. We talked about that, you know, there was the camels, there were all these things. They were trying to find a wife for Isaac. Um, and yes, this was an arranged type of a marriage. This was, this was something that was going on. But you'll notice the one thing that happens in this passage, that Isaac truly loved Rebecca. There was true love here. 
It wasn't, it wasn't like a, a regret or anxiousness, but there was true love. And we learned last week that you never outgrow the need for faith in God. You never graduate from faith. You never do. People can tell you, what's the key to the Christian life? I'll tell you, faith. Because you have to believe God. And believing God is just more than he exists, but that you trust his character and his actions and whatever happens in our lives. And in verses 10 through 27, we said there was action and obedience, that the, the master's servant was able to, to, to trust so much that he went and he did the things that his master requested of him. This passage is not just a story of the God-fearing parent, but a continuation, a story of the continuation of the line of promise. God in his providence brought about a continuation of the, his line. And as we look at the third section of chapter 24, um, which will be the first section tonight, we see that the servant's explanation to Rebecca's family. And in that passage, we learn that prayer is the instrument and the response of God's providence. That what we should do in, in life is that prayer is the proper response to God's providence. When we see God's providence, we pray. And, and prayer is also the, the cause and the ingredient and the instrument of that prominence. So we think about God's providence all the time and God is working all things out. But you know that us on our knees are, is still part of God's providence. In fact, part of God's plan is to drive us to our knees, isn't it? To pray. To pray. We're going to look at that. And then verses 54 through 58, we see another thing. That, that urgency is a proper response to God's providence. That we don't have a lot of time. That we should do God's will today, not tomorrow, today. That we don't put off things that are of that highly important. We do God's business first, in fact, before eating. And finally, we, we realize that we should seek God's kingdom is the proper response to God's providence. So tonight, we're going to respond to God's providence. We're going to respond in the proper way. We're going to take action. We're going to learn about that. So let's look at the first thing. Prayer is the proper response to God's providence. And I would say it's also the instrument of God's providence. But if I wanted the alliteration to go right, prayer is the response to God's providence. But it's part of that providence. Do you, do you understand that? Because, because first, if you look at what's going on, you see prayer is part of it. It is the instrument that God uses. The servant's prayers are in large part part of the story. You see, we, we think about God pro providentially acting but we don't think about God providentially causing and bending our knee to him so that he could answer the prayers in response to his will and his providential plan. Prayers accomplish things with God. The servant's prayers, in response to his prayers, God does miraculous things. God uses his prayers to carry out God's own plan and design. But we also see in the passage that the servant's response to God's providence is unfolded to him, is, is to bow himself in praise. When you really experience God's providential care, you bow in worship. I can tell you that when I felt and believed that God was calling me on staff to Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now called Crew. We had to raise our own financial support. My salary back then was $610 a month. I was living in Southern California. I had to raise about, but I had to raise about $1,400 a month. And I was, I didn't know what I was going to do to raise that kind of money. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. In fact, one of my good friends that I met on staff, they raised over $2,000 a month in three days. And they were off to their assignment. Are you familiar with people on staff with Crusade? Do you all know Campus Crusade for Christ? Have you ever experienced them or known some staff members? 
Well, I was on there, and it's the place where Ann and I met. It's the place where, where God really nurtured me at the beginning of my Christian faith, and I wanted to believe that God was calling me to something full-time in ministry. But I had to have trust in God. One person came to me at the end of my time, support raising. It took me a year to raise my support. A whole year. Never got a lot of money. Some people would pledge $30 this week and $40 this week and $10 this week and $30 this week. and No really big, big, big pledges. But a friend of mine came to me and she goes, what God has done in raising your support, you knew nobody after the first two weeks to ask. I, I knew nobody. I had asked everybody I knew to support me in the first two weeks and I knew nobody else. My mom and dad, they, they weren't going to let me ask any of their friends because they thought I was going through a fad. They go, no, no, you can't do that. You can't, you can't devote yourself to full-time ministry and they're not even going to pay you? What are you doing? I told my parents that, you know, just like Moses, he had all the privileges in the world, but he chose to be, what? Counted with his people. He chose to suffer for it with his people. I said, you know, I, I choose the same thing. I, I'd rather be in Christian ministry. And let me just say, everybody in this room is in Christian ministry that names the names of Christ. It's not just for the pastor. I'm not a hireling, okay? You don't hire me to do the ministry. You hire me to get you to do the ministry, ultimately, right? You're the one that's supposed to do I'm supposed to support you and to equip you to do the work of ministry. The best thing a pastor could say is he actually worked himself out of a job. That he was able to train so many people that the church was busting with people who wanted to minister to other people. But here we have prayers. Now, I want to point out a few things before we recount the story. First of all, in verse 30, I want you to look at that, verse 30. You see something. You see Laban's character. When Laban saw the ring and the bracket, bracelets on his sister's wrist, and he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, what did he do? He, go out, he went out immediately to the man, and he invited him in. See, Laban, Laban was a man of the world. Laban had eyes on those jewels. See, the character of Laban is just perfectly fit here. Laban is a man who does not miss the gifts of this world. He will not overlook such wealth, but Laban does provide superb hospitality in verses 31 and 32. But isn't it interesting that even Laban spreads out his feast before Abraham's servant, and Abraham's servant will not allow himself to eat or be deterred of the task of divine providence. He will not sit down while work, there's work to be done. For his, this servant, God's business comes first. In verses 34 through 39, recount the story, and he tells, and he tells them, and, it, and he, he culminates with a bold request. In fact, it's an audacious request. But the servant didn't think it was audacious because he knew of God's providence. God's going before us. He, he, he shows favor even before we get there. He cuts right to the chase. And the power of his word, oh, the power of his word here is amazing. He does not leave anything out. He makes it clear that God's hand has been in this from the beginning. You could recount your lives that way. God's hand has been in your life from the beginning. God hasn't left you alone, not one day since you professed, not even before you professed Jesus, but even since you professed Jesus, he has never, ever, ever left you alone. He's been always behind the scenes. He's always been by your side. He has never, ever left you. And when you pray, God has put that into plan, part of his plan of action. And he tells of Abraham's, the servant tells of Abraham's riches that have been appealing to Rebekah's family, but he, he stresses that the Lord is the one who gave these riches to him. And that Abraham's riches are going to how many people? One son. So the family probably is thinking, well, that's not bad. That's a good deal. 
That's very appealing in verses 35 and 36. But he goes on to explain in verses 37 and 38 why Abraham did not take a son for his wife in the land of Canaan. He says he wanted a son for his wife amongst his people. See, God was providentially moving Abraham to do exactly what he wanted to be done in preserving the line of Christ. And he says, now let me tell you, even if I come back here with no wife, he puts all his cards on the table. If I come back with no wife, Abraham told me that if he refused me, in the case of Rebekah, he will release me from the oath. In other words, it doesn't matter to me what you choose. It does, but it doesn't because guess what? Either way, I'm going to be released from the oath that I took. I'm not going to be in any danger. I'm not going to, I, I, I'm not going to be doing things that says, boy, uh, I'm going to be in big trouble if you don't give me Rebecca. He wasn't going to use guilt. He wasn't going to use that as a, a method of doing things. The servant raises himself, raises the issue of the gir girl uh, and the family refusing to agree in the marriage. It was him who did it. And then he repeats verbatim Abraham's promise to free him from that obligation. And we see this in verses 41, 40 and 41. In verse 40, again, we notice that he stresses what? It is the Lord who will give the journey success. It is the Lord that will give your journey success. You see in verses 30, 42 and 48, he says, let me tell you a story that you won't believe. Let me, let me tell you how God had been at work in this impossible mission that God has given me. And he tells the Lord's providence, revealing Rebekah to him at the well. And in verses 44, 42 and 44, his prayer, emphasizing again God's providence. In verse, verses 45 through 47, he tells the story of his immediately, immediate in, initial encounter with Rebekah. But in, not but a few moments after the prayer had been uttered in his heart, did Rebekah show up. He then tells of the content of his prayer and of thanksgiving in verse 48, and Rebekah appeared. He tells that he asked Rebekah for, for water. And he says, if she's going to do that, tell her to give my camel some water. And he says, God's hand is so over this. It's so apparent. Have you ever been in a situation where God's hand has been so apparent in what you've been doing? I tell you, I, I raised support for that year. And I raised support. And it didn't matter how hard I worked at it. It didn't matter how many calls. I used to, I used to praise the Lord when 9 o'clock came. Because that means I didn't have to make any support calls. That was my job. Raising funds so I could go to do a mission that God, I believe, had called me to. It was hard on me. But this person, friend of mine, says, I just saw God every step of the way in your life. You never got down. I go, well, you didn't see me alone. You, you never got frustrated. You were always up and you always encouraged me. I said, really? I, th that experience to me showed me that God's hand is always on our lives. When we pray, when we give, when we witness, everything we do, God has always gone before you. And that providence should cause us to pray. Just like the servant did. When he saw the, the great things God was due, he would pray, he would give thanks, and he would worship. I could go through some of the things he did, but you know, he, he did a lot of things, but um, at the end of all this, the first part of the story in verses 52, when he heard the answer from Laban and his father and his brothers and his family, he said, it says here, and Abraham heard the words and he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. He worshipped again. Because he believed that everything that was happening, that God was getting the glory, God was in charge of, and God should get the credit for, and he worshipped God because he was dependent upon God. I'll tell you something about prayer. If, if you're dependent upon God, we pray. 
If we're not dependent on God, guess what we do? We forget to pray. And prayer is one of the hardest things to continue to do in our lives. The average pastor in the United States, statistics say, pray about five minutes a day. The average church member in evangelical churches, these are Bible-believing churches, pray about two minutes a day. That's probably before meals. The American church does not depend on God. We depend on a lot of things. But we don't see God's providential hand working in lives and we don't depend upon God when you don't pray. I had a friend of mine who was on staff with me at Campus Crusade and every six months we had a day of prayer. A whole day. The staff didn't go to work. We went to a, a convoy or a, or a place where we would gather together and we would pray for eight hours. That was our job, just to pray. I had a roommate that would never go to that. And, and not because he wasn't a believer. He was struggling in his heart spiritually. There were things going on in his heart of hearts that made it hard because have you ever really tried to pray for eight hours? Gone away and just said, Lord, I'm praying today. Let me tell you, your flesh doesn't like it. Let me be honest, your flesh probably is going to rise up and go, you can't do that. Look at all the stuff that you've got to do. Right? It's hard to pray. We are very self-sufficient people. We like people to say, man, look at your success. Look at what you've done. Look at what you've accomplished. You have, you have benefit to our society. Look at all that. Everything that I've accomplished in life has been because of God's providential goodness to me, his care of me. The reason why we're here tonight and, and alive and be able to, able to do things is because of God's providential care that should cause us to bow in prayer, be dependent upon God. That's number one, prayer. When you see God's providence working out in your life, you meet someone that you, you know, it's uncanny that you met them years ago and now they're brought back into your life because God's providential care for you. I know of a missionary who went overseas to a missionary, met his next door neighbor over there. And they were the only two English speaking people in the land. God provided fellowship. God will provide. God will provide for a church. He provides if we pray. I'm reminded of, before I move on, I'm going to do this. Oh, I got to do this quick. I'll see how I do this. I'm going to share this on Wednesday too. It just really moved me. Charles Spurgeon was the pastor at Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. When my mom and dad uh, lived over in London, England, I was able to go there oh, maybe six, seven, eight times to hear now Peter Masters, who's the pastor there, preach and to meet him and to tour the grounds and become part of the, yes, I got on the list for the book club at that place, yes. Um, they have, a, they have a bookstore and everything there. But uh, Spurgeon would preach and he would, he, you know, he was a big man. And, and one day the, the church was full. It was packed. And four guys come into the place. And he's sitting up there saying, young men, come here. And they go, who, me? He said, come here. So they, they walked up. He says, there's no places to sit today, but what I want to do is I want to take you down to the boiler room. They go, the boiler room? Why, why go down to the boiler room? Have you been, ever been in the boiler room here? Why, why would you want to go and just sit in the boiler room? He 
says, come on down. I'm going to take you to the boiler room. And they go, why do I want to sit in the boiler room? But eventually they came forward and as he was leading them down, they're, they're, they're looking all around, they're going down the steps and they're going down the steps, they're looking all around and he gets to the boiler room and he opens up the boiler room and there were 700 people in the boiler room praying for the service that was happening that morning. 700 people praying on their knees in a boiler room for God to move and to work. We are dependent upon God. And when we see his providence, we should pray. Secondly, real quickly, when we see God's providence, it should promote urgency. Not complacency, urgency. Awareness of the Lord's prov providence promotes urgency. Immediate obedience is the theme throughout the Bible. You've heard this before. Delayed obedience is what? Sin. If you're not willing to do it now, there's no guarantee you're not willing to do it later or later or later. To deal with what is in your heart, you have to deal with it now, not later. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation, right? Not tomorrow. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow. Immediate obedience. Immediate obedience. And he said, listen, listen what he said when he, when he, um, um, when he got to there. He got there and, and they were wanting to feed him. And he said in verse 33, the food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. He wouldn't even take a bite until he had to do what God had told him to do first. It's amazing. That, that the providence of God, he, he so believed that God was doing everything along the way that he was going to do it immediately. He was going to get it over with. He was going to do exactly what the Lord wanted him to do. I don't know if they, at, at the end here, there was a delay tactic and he would not accept a delay tactic either. The mother and the brother think Rebecca is going to stay and so they said, please take, uh, take me away from my, he said, please don't take me away from my family so quickly. So they, get, he says, they basically asked him, give me a few days to spend with her and them. But they, they, they had to go to ask Rebecca and she said, I'll go, I'll go. And so Rebecca's character is revealed. She was always ready and willing to do God's bidding. See, we'll share the gospel many times and people will make professions of faith. And then we ask them, well, come, come to church. Come and worship with us and come. And we wonder why. Or we'll back off. We'll say, well, well we're not going to press you right now. It's, 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 you know, you, you take your time and, and decide what you want to do with the Lord Jesus. Decide what you want to do with the Lord Jesus. More and more, I'm thinking that that's the wrong way to go. If we're going to be willing to do what God says for us to do, we've got to be willing to do it now. There's an urgency. When God's providence is in, God is providentially working, the issue is now, not later. Finally, we see not only prayer is the proper response to God's providence. Not only do we see urgency is the proper response to God's providence, we also see seeking his kingdom is the proper response to God's kingdom. Verses 59 through 67. Verses 59 through 67. Rebecca departs and goes on to Merrick Isaac. We see first the kingdom of God takes care of all things. You know, there's something much bigger than just the relationship between Rebecca and Isaac going on in this passage. A beautiful and great story. It, and especially in this section about Isaac and Rebecca, there's something much bigger going on in their lives than their personal needs or their personal relationship. And as gracious as God is in providing for those, we immensely sense the significance of this union for all of redemptive history. This, this, this union was necessary for carrying on 
the line of promise. The union was necessary for providing the continuance of a godly seed, the seed of a woman that we looked at in the book of Genesis back in chapter 3, verse 15. And yet God provides, or verse 3, 16, yet God provides for their, their details and their needs even as they seek the kingdom of God first. You know, the Bible says that if we seek God's kingdom, what will happen? Everything will be what? Added unto you. When we see God doing that, it should cause us what? To seek his kingdom all that much more. First, not second, not third, not fourth. See, we should be a bunch of kingdom seekers. As believers, we are the seekers of God. Lost people don't seek God, we seek God. We invite them to search out and seek God, but we're the ones that seek the kingdom of God first in our lives. As she goes, they sing a song to her. They bless her. Saying, oh sister, may, your, may you become thousands of ten thousand. May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. In other words, may your offspring take vengeance on those who come up before your husband, who come against your husband. It was a covenantal blessing. Something that would have been sincere, would have been certainly sincere, sincere, but something else was necessary. When Jesus called people to be his disciples, many times disciples would say, well, those are really hard things. I mean, they're hard things. to, to you, you have to hate your mother and brother and sister and, and, and come and follow me or you cannot be my disciple. If, if you put your hand to a plow and look back, what does he say? You cannot be my disciple. There's a parable about a, a man who wanted to go back home and, and um, take care of his family before. And he said, unless you're willing to follow me, you cannot be my disciple. See, all through the Bible, the disciples of Jesus believed in God's providence. They believed that God was working everything out and God was going before them and God was going coming behind them. If they had a dif difficult situation at work, guess what? God was there. God had been there beforehand. God may have been there in the testing of their faith in the midst of that. Finally, you see a lonely man in the middle of a field in this story. Meditating by himself. And he lifts up his eyes. He sees a caravan of camels coming. Rebecca comes and supplies his need in verses 64 and 65. And Rebecca sees him. Immediately she dismounts. She does not want to meet her groom standing over him on a beast looking and having him look up to, but looking up to him, showing him respect. She immediately veils herself to identify herself as his bride out of modesty. The veil was a sign of betrothal and, and identified her to Isaac as his bride. In verse 67, Moses tells us explicitly that Isaac had genuine love for her. She was taken to his mother's tent. This indicated she was now the mistress of the household. She was the woman that God had appointed to be the matriarch in the family. I ask a question. Whether it's the church, whether it's your life, are we f willing to follow God no matter what? And to let him supply our needs. If you're like anybody, it is much easier to trust what you have than what you don't have. Right? It's a lot easier to trust what you already have than what you don't have. But if we would walk in faith, believing that God is ordaining and controlling and working and, 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 and shaping our lives together, and we would follow him in whatever he says and whatever he wants us to do, 
and trust him to meet our needs. We'll see God's providential care of our lives. You'll see that God genuinely loves you. That God actually will give mercy to you and you'll see it more and more every day of our lives. We should be able to say, you know, God was working today in my life. Not just 10 years ago or 15 years ago. God is working today. How has he worked today? Where do you see him working today? See, see the servant who went and got the, 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 the wife for Isaac saw God everywhere. Saw God working all through the story. And your life is the same way. It's a story of God working. This church is a story of God's working. Sometimes he's, he's blessing, sometimes he's disciplining. Sometimes he's raising up, sometimes he's shaping. He's putting us through the crucible of fire. But he knows what's coming up next, right? He knows what's going to happen to our lives. And you know what? He's building faith within us. It's not, our faith is not left to ourselves. God's working that faith in our lives by his spirit through the, through the events of our lives so that we may prove that God is faithful and true and good and kind and gracious. This is a great story. When you think of it, it's a story of how God works in all of our lives. God arranges things. God has arranged your friends. God has arranged everything. God has arranged your parents. You don't know everybody in the world, but the people you know are by God's providence. There's a reason you know the people you know, in other words, I'm saying. They're, they're here to be ministered to. Whether it's here in the church, whether it's at work, maybe it's out and maybe it's your next door neighbor. Maybe, maybe you need to go over and just invite them over to read the Bible with you. One of the greatest ways we, we can do something is just speak the word of God to people. That's what the early church did. They just kept speaking the word of God back and forth across the fence everywhere they went. Yes, some people didn't like that. Some people liked it. But you know what? God's word doesn't come back void. It accomplishes what he sends it out to do. And if we will trust that God's working, we'll see God arranging things for our good. The Bible says, which now they say is the most popular verse in the Bible, Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him are called what? According to his purposes. He's causing everything to work out. He's causing even the things that come into our lives to be for our good. God didn't have plan B and plan C and plan D and plan E. He has plan A. And so tonight I pray as we close in prayer that if you need to trust Christ publicly in baptism because that's really the way that we publicly identify with Christ, isn't it? Walking up an aisle doesn't save you. It may be an expression of your faith but walking an aisle doesn't save us. What saves us is what? Faith. Faith in God. And faith in Christ and what he has accomplished on the cross. That's providential. We see that in the New Testament. For at the right time, Jesus was born. At the right time, Jesus died. At the right time, he will come back. I don't know when that is. But at the right time, he will come back for his people. Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight and ask that as we have closed looking at your word tonight. I, I pray, Father, that this story would, would be a great story of grand encouragement. Father, I pray that, that as we go home to our families and friends, we would see that you're working all things out for our good. You're, 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 you're involved in every part of our lives. There is no place we go that you're not there. 
And Father, when we, when we do ministry to other people, when we share the gospel with other people, you've already gone ahead of us to soften their hearts, to prepare hearts for difficult conversations that we need to have. You're already there. You're already there that for that next job and that next issue and that next thing. You have already been there working that all out. Father, I pray that we would be willing to do whatever you cause us to, want us to do. Change our hearts. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.